Just like many topics this year, once you feel confident, you realize that things aren't that simple, such is the case with genetics. This is video 11.2, which looks at some exceptions to Mendelian genetics that fall into the category of non-Mendelian genetics. We are cruising right along. This video will cover these five topics. Uh, the video will cover the concepts and we'll cover some problems in class. Pause the video for a closer look at these goals. Remember from our last video that Mendelian genetics follows these three rules. The trait is determined by one locus, or one gene. Individual has two alleles that influence that trait, where one allele is dominant and the other is recessive. What scientists were finding, though, is that there were a lot of situations that weren't exactly lining up with Mendel's model. So scientists did what scientists do, and they came up with new models to see if the data they were observing fit those models. Our first exception to Mendelian genetics is incomplete dominance. In incomplete dominance, the heterozygote individuals show an intermediate or blended phenotype. A classic example of incomplete dominance is snapdragon flower color. When parental red flowered snapdragons are cross-pollinated with parental white flowered snapdragons, the resulting F1s are all pink. So, neither red nor white are dominant. But when the F1 generation self-pollinates, the resulting F2s have a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of red, pink, and white flowered plants. The heterozygote, pink, is a blend of red and white. Let's look at another example. Here, you see straight and curly hair in humans. This woman has very straight hair, and if she has an offspring with this man that has very curly hair, the resulting offspring would have wavy hair, an intermediate between straight and curly. Our second exception to Mendelian genetics is called co-dominance. Co-dominance is when heterozygotes show evidence of both alleles. A fun example is this analogy over here. The dad is wearing horizontal stripes and the mom is wearing vertical stripes. Their baby shows both phenotypes simultaneously, horizontal stripes and vertical stripes. Now we could adapt this to show incomplete dominance instead of co-dominance. So with co-dominance, you see both stripes. Incomplete dominance would be if this child had diagonal stripes. A biological example is flower color in this plant species over here. You can see cross-pollination where uh, there's red flowers and uh, white flowers. In co-dominance, the resulting F1 offspring would have patches of red and patches of white. So you see both phenotypes. This is in contrast to the situation of incomplete dominance that we saw before, where the F1 offspring would have a blended phenotype. So in codominance, you see both phenotypes at the same time. Another example of codominance is the ABO blood typing system. ABO blood typing violates Mendelian genetics for two reasons. First, there's not a dominant and recessive allele, and second, there are more than two alleles. The ABO blood type keeps track of cell surface markers on the surface of red blood cells. There's an A cell surface marker and a B cell surface marker. O gives neither of the cell surface markers. What this creates is a situation where type A and B are co-dominant, but both A and B show complete dominance to type O. So a person with A, B blood type will have both the A phenotype and the B phenotype at the same time. Interestingly, another common uh, blood type antigen, the Rh factor, shows classic Mendelian inheritance. So this is like if your blood is A positive or O negative, the positive or negative part of your blood type is the Rh factor. So Rh factor shows typical Mendelian's inheritance pattern where Rh positive is dominant to Rh negative. So you can see in this cross, you get 1 plus plus, 2 plus minuses, 
and 1 minus minus. Both of these genotypes give the phenotype of Rh positive, whereas only negative negative gives Rh negative, classic Mendelian inheritance. Another non-Mendelian genetic pattern is pleiotropy. With pleiotropy, one gene has effects in many traits. A lot of times, the traits even appear to be somewhat unrelated. In contrast with Mendelian inheritance, one gene is associated with one trait. So an example of pleiotropy could be a condition called achondroplasia, a type of dwarfism that results from the mutation of FGF receptor 3. This signaling pathway normally causes mitosis in cartilage cells during bone development. And the phenotypes for this allele include all of these down here, a large skull, short flat vertebrae, and deformed hips, all from the result of changing the allele in one gene. Another example of pleiotropy is a disease called phenylketonuria, or PKU. PKU is caused by a mutated allele for the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene, which normally converts the amino acid phenylalanine into the amino acid tyrosine. As a result of this one allele, there are many effects on traits, which include brain, eye, kidney, and liver damage. Next on our list of non-Mendelian genetic inheritance patterns is epistasis. The definition of epistasis is when the genotype of one locus affects how another locus is expressed. Looking at this example can give some insight. In this example, um, the ability to have pigment in mouse fur is controlled by the C locus. The pigment itself is controlled by the B locus. Here's how it works. In the C locus, having pigment is completely dominant to not having pigment. If the mouse fur can have pigment, then the B locus determines what color that pigment will be. Black is completely dominant to brown pigment. But the weird thing is, is that if the C locus is homozygous recessive, then it doesn't matter what's going on at the B locus. The mouse will still be white. So if there's little c, little c, homozygous recessive, then the mouse will have no pigment, no matter what. Little c, little c, big B, big B, little c, little c, big B, little b, and little c, little c, little b, little b are all white because of epistasis. A similar example of epistasis happens in Labrador retrievers. The E locus controls the ability to have dark pigment. Having dark pigment is dominant to not having pigment. So, if a laboratory retriever has little e, little e, then it will be a yellow lab no matter what's going on with the B locus. The B locus, the other locus, controls which dark pigment will be made. Black is completely dominant to brown. So if the E locus is homozygous dominant or heterozygous, then the B locus can come into play. A brown fur Labrador retriever is called a chocolate lab, and a black one is just called a black lab. Next up for non-Mendelian inheritance is polygenic inheritance. Remember where pleiotropy from a couple slides ago is where one gene influences many phenotypes? Well, polygenic inheritance is the opposite. In polygenic inheritance, one phenotype is affected by many genes. What this means is that there are multiple levels or a spectrum of phenotypes. A classic example to help you think about this would be skin color. Suppose that skin color is determined by three loci, A, B, and C. In this example, each dominant allele contributes one unit of pigment. So the big A, big B, or big C give a pigment unit, and the little letters give no pigment units. So if all six alleles are dominant, you'll have the darkest skin possible. But if all six alleles are recessive, then you'll have the lightest skin possible. And there are all of these possibilities in between. You can't discuss skin color without thinking about albinism. Albinism isn't when you have all recessive alleles for all the loci that influence skin pigmentation. 
Albinism is caused by a mutation in a protein involved in making melanin, a pigment. If that protein is missing, then it doesn't matter what's going on at the three pigment loci. The organism won't be able to make any pigment and will be albino. There are so many examples of albinism throughout the animal kingdom. You see humans, gorillas, and peacocks in here, and it's in so many other animals as well. But since albinism in the wild is a disadvantage in terms of camouflage for predators and for prey, you usually don't see these organisms surviving and reproducing too much. Next up is sex-linked traits. In all of the examples so far, the loci we followed have been on one of the non-sex chromosomes, like all of these guys here. Non-sex chromosomes are chromosome pairs 1 through 22 in humans, and the non-sex chromosomes are called autosomes. So a trait encoded by genes on non-sex chromosomes is called an autosomal trait, but a trait encoded by a gene on the X or Y chromosome is called a sex-linked trait. Sex-linked traits were first discovered in Drosophila melanogaster, a, a fruit fly. Fruit flies are used in a lot of genetics experiments because they're really cheap and easy to maintain in a small space. Moreover, Drosophila fruit flies are very prolific, they have a short generation time, and they have a simple genome with only eight chromosomes that's easy to sort out and follow. So here's the, the classic example of sex-linked traits, eye color in fruit flies. This work was done by Thomas Hunt Morgan a few decades after Mendel's death and is considered a huge extension of Mendel's ideas. In fact, Thomas Hunt Morgan won a Nobel Prize for his work. Anyway, Drosophila eye color. For the parental generation, Morgan crossed red-eyed females with white-eyed males. The resulting F1 offspring were all red-eyed. When the F1s were allowed to interbreed, there was a mixture of red-eyed and white-eyed offspring, but only in males. In the F2 generation, all of the females had red eyes, but 50% of the males had red eyes and 50% of the males had white eyes. Obviously, Mendel's model wasn't working to explain this. But Mendel's ideas in the Punnett Square were still valuable tools in being able to sort all this out. For the genotypes of the breeders, we have to consider their sex chromosomes. Females have two X chromosomes, and males have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Since all of the F1 generation had red eyes, we know that red is dominant to white. So we'll use big R for red, and white will be little r. Since this is a sex-linked gene, we're attaching the R alleles to the X chromosome so that the female is X big R, X big R, and the male is X little r, Y. When you segregate the alleles and cross them on a Punnett square, here are the results. All of the females are X big R, X little r, and all of the males are X big R, Y, with red eyes. So all of these guys have red eyes. If you take one of each of those flies and cross them, here's what you get. Females can be X big R, X big R, or X big R, X little r. In both cases, they'd have red eyes. Males can be X big R, Y with red eyes, or X little r, Y with white eyes, giving a 50-50 ratio. Now, using Punnett squares and thinking about this them this way was revolutionary and required a lot of imagination for Thomas Hunt Morgan to sort out. So, here are the rules on sex-linked genes that are on the X chromosome. Females have two X chromosomes. With an allele linked to each X chromosome, females work a lot like keeping track of autosomal genes. What I mean is that you, if you have just... Uh, big A, little a, that's autosomal, and the trait will be dominant. But a female that has X, big A, X, little a, works the same, or she'll have the dominant trait. Males have only one X chromosome, one copy of the genes that are on the X chromosome. So this means that the one version of the X chromosome that the male gets determines the phenotype of the male. So if there's X, little a, the male has the recessive phenotype. 
there's no second allele that you have to check to see if the little a is masked or not. With sex-linked genes, there are X-linked and Y-linked possibilities, but X-linked examples are way more frequent. It's because there just aren't that many genes on the Y chromosome. But one really cool gene on the Y chromosome is the SRY gene. The SRY gene is considered the master male gene. That's kind of like the, the captain of the team that turns on all of the other genes at the levels that those genes are needed for the male phenotype. The X chromosome, on the other hand, is loaded with genes. Check this out. This is just a partial list of the human diseases that are caused by mutations in a gene on the X chromosome. Another X chromosome phenomenon is called X inactivation. In some cells of females, one of the X chromosomes will be inactivated. So here are the females over here, and you can see that one X chromosome is active, and the other kind of balls up. Um, and you can see that in each of the female cells. This balled up X chromosome is called a bar body, and that balled up X chromosome is inactive. So the only X chromosome that's making a gene product is the one that's um, seen as an X here. This creates an interesting phenotype in some cases, like these tortoise shell cats. So in this case, Cat coat color is controlled by a gene on the X chromosome. There's an orange or a black version of this gene. Male fur color is determined by whichever one X chromosome they get, so it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the situation is also pretty straightforward for homozygous females. In each cell, one chromosome is inactivated, but there will always be the same version of the active um, X chromosome in each cell. The interesting scenario comes in heterozygotes. Since the inactivation of the X chromosome is random, some cells will have an active orange version and other cells will have an active black version of the X chromosome. The end phenotype is a cat with patches of orange and patches of black right next to each other, a condition called tortoise shell. Calico cats work the same way, so if you see a calico or tortoiseshell cat, probably a female. The last concept I want to touch on is called epigenetics. Our focus so far has been that the phenotype of an organism is only due to the genotype, but the fact is that environmental conditions can shape the phenotype as well. Here are three classic examples of epigenetics. In Arctic foxes, in the summer when it's warmer, they make pigment for their fur, but when it's cold, they don't make the pigment. So the same fox is darker in warm environments than in cold environments. This flower down here is called a hydrangea. Depending on the soil pH, the same plant could either have purple or pink flowers. In humans, the amount of sun exposure in the environment can influence skin color. So while the basics of your skin color are genetically programmed, the environmental conditions play a role in the final phenotype. This is epigenetics. So this has been a lot. Let's recap. Endelian genetics paved the way for understanding so many diverse inheritance patterns, but Mendelian genetics followed certain rules. The more scientists started following genetics, the more they found examples that break the rules. But with a little bit of imagination, scientists were able to rethink and reshape Mendel's models to understand how even some unconventional inheritance patterns work. It seems like we've gone over a ton of examples, including all of these down here, but the field of genetics has expanded even more. We're just laying the foundation here for you to understand as you study more.